Amen. God richly bless you. Welcome to another Bible study night. Uh, we are blessed to be alive and to be well. And even in the midst of what took place this week, we are still here and we are grateful that God showed his mercy on us. You know, as I think about what happened, I remind of the scripture in Lamentations chapter 3, however, verse 22 to verse 25, it said, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassion fail not. Verse 23 said, They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, say my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seek him. Praise God. And as we think about that, we realize that it really is God's mercy while we are here. Praise God. And we are grateful and happy that the Lord saw it fit to bring us through another uh, bring us to another week so that we can again get into the word. So we are grateful and we are blessed. Praise God. Before we go into Bible study, I want to remind us that we will be having, praise God, our national convention next week under the theme, Hold the Fort, Jesus is Coming. I pray God that everybody is prepared and is ready and is prayed up for such a powerful event that we are anticipating uh, in the presence of the Almighty God. The venue will be at, obviously, 53 Malines Road, Kingston. Praise God. And the time is from November 5 to 10. Amen. And, and we're having church 10.30 Sunday morning. And from Sunday night to Friday night, it is 7 p.m. If there's any change to any of these nights, we will advise you. But I want us to realize that we must hold it forth. Be ready because Jesus is coming. So we are anticipating a grand time in the presence of the Almighty God. Amen. Bow your heads as we go, before we go into Bible study, as I pray. Great God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for tonight. We thank you, God, for one more time that we are in your presence to give you glory and to give you honor and to give you praise. I pray, God, as we go back into your word, as we break bread one more time, oh God, that you will be with us. Open our minds, open our hearts, open our spirit. That we may be able to Jesus one more time to learn from you and to learn as thus say the Lord. Touch every hearer tonight. And I pray God that it will be a blessing upon us, be in our houses, be in our minds, be in our spirit. As we look to you, God, who is able to guide us and to bring us through. Thank you, God, one more time for what you have done. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for sparing our lives even in this week, that we might live to see another time and on another day. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are faithful. Hallelujah. It's of your mercies, as we say, that you're not, that we are not consumed. For your compassion fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Uh, we are grateful, Lord Jesus, that we have hope in you. So whether we live or die, hallelujah, we have hope in you. Touch us one more time and help us, Lord Jesus, to learn from tonight's study as we look to you, who is the author and the finish of our faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. And I pray, God, that you'll learn something from the Bible study tonight. God bless you in Jesus' name. Let's go into the study. Praise God. So, you know, last week we started on a very important subject, the whole subject of the mission-driven church. Amen. And we did say last week that, you know, there are three ministries that the church has to take part in. The church exists for three main reasons. And we use a diagram, but tonight I'll do the same thing without using the diagram, but actually stating what they are. We say we have to minister to God. That speaks to our relationship with God, our worship, our walk. And this is expressed through our prayer life, our fasting, our worship, and our Bible study. You know, that's our ministry to the Almighty God. Then we talk about our ministry to one another. Amen. Um, that's in relation to all, to each other as Christians. And this is special to our love, our fellowship, and our serving. And we made mention of that the fact that the second ministry has to do with discipleship. So the first one has to do with worship. The second one has to do with discipleship. And the third one has to do with the ministry to the world. Amen. Relation with those who we do not know, or people who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And this is expressed through evangelism, outreach, church planting, and missions. And tonight, our aim is to uh, 
go through the topic as we continue along the, the third area, which is missions. How do we as a church be driven by this task that the Lord has placed upon us? Amen. So the Great Commission is mandate to, for us to make disciples, Matthew 28, 19, make disciples of all men. Amen. And this making of disciples actually speaks to two things. It speaks to the winning of souls for Christ. Again, that is evangelism. But making disciples also mean bringing them to a point of maturity in Christ. And that's discipleship. So our aim tonight is to really focus on point one, which is practically winning souls for Jesus Christ. But we must understand that the Great Commission also uh, encapsulates the whole idea of also bringing saints in the house of God to a point of maturity in Christ, and that is discipleship. Amen. So as children of God, I pray God that we will take the Great Commission very seriously. Amen. As we look forward to what the Lord has tasked us to do. Amen. You know, last week we, 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 we looked at certain things for example we said if we're going to do mission mission we have to know first of all who we are amen and we did declare that we are the the church of the living god the ecclesia amen the called out ones amen and we say that if we're going to do mission we must know what we do amen and and who do we do it for praise god and and we know what we do um we practically get involved in missions because that is what the Lord has called us um, to do as a church. Amen. So we are supposed to do mission. Who we are, we are the church. What we do, uh, we are determined to preach Christ, as we said last week, and him crucified. Praise God. We are determined to preach Christ and him crucified. Everything else is second uh, to this particular command. And we look at the example of the Apostle Paul, who, as he went to the church at Corinth, uh, this was his message to the point where he thought that he brought a simple message, but his message was, was the most powerful message. Amen. Uh, they saw it as foolish because it was different in comparison, amen, to the other religions of the Greeks. You know, we talk about um, the Greeks having, uh, for example, Themis, the god of law and justice, and Zeus, the lightning god, and Hermes, the winged messenger god. Amen. I would say all these gods seem to have uh, some form of ex external power, as it were. But in contrast, amen, to all of the excitement and the intellect and the power that the Greeks preach about, Paul said, look here, our message is to preach about a man who was born in a manger, amen, who grew up in Nazareth. And, by the, and, and, and let me tell you something, Nazareth was not a nice place. You know, it's like, it's like a man say, um, in Jamaica, I, I was born in the middle, middle of some ghetto area or some, some inner city area, amen. So Nazareth was a similar thing. And it shows us to the point where they, they even ask the question, can any good thing come out of Nazareth, amen? So you can imagine Paul was saying that we are going to preach Christ. This man who was born in a manger, the man who grew up in Nazareth, the man who died on a cross and was placed in a place called Golgotha. Amen. Uh, and it's, so we're saying that Jesus was a crucified Messiah. And we did say last week that saying that Jesus is a crucified Messiah was a contradiction of terms because it's either you're crucified and defeated or you're a Messiah and victorious. But this is the message, amen, that we preach. We preach Christ and him crucified amen and who do we do it for we say we do this for jesus christ himself amen we say as a church dream for mission we have four types of growth that will result from us getting involved in mission last week we talked about internal growth and this refers to spiritual growth of people within the church praise god we talked about expansion growth last week and this is growth that has to do with uh, evangelism that is fulfilled by the church. Amen. We talk about extension. So as people grow in the church, the numbers grow in the church, the church is expanding. That's expansion growth. They have extension growth where we start to plant new churches, um, but within our particular culture. And we talk about bridging growth, which is practically uh, now getting churches, but outside of our culture. Praise God. So last week we, we discussed some, some powerful things. We spoke about the whole role of the Holy Ghost. We said the Holy Ghost is what directs us in our mission. 
as a church, we are compelled, amen, by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is who directs us and tells us what to do, amen. And if it's not Holy Ghost moved, uh, Holy Ghost driven, amen, that is really not a true mission driven church because it's the Holy Ghost who dictates who, where we go and where we shouldn't go. We look at the example in Acts chapter 16 last week where the Apostle Paul wanted to go to a particular area, amen, but he was compelled by the Holy Ghost. He was, he was stopped by the Holy Ghost from going to that area and said he must go to another area, which means that even though it was his heartbeat to go in this area, the Holy Ghost was the one who was calling the shots and decided where we should or should not go. And we said we can only be led by the Holy Ghost when we are a church of prayer. So prayer must must what must be the thing that influences, amen, our mission. And then we summarize last week by saying the church is to present Jesus to the world as Lord and Savior. And the church is established believers in the apostolic doctrine, principles, and practices. We said the aim of the church is to spread the gospel to the world. And we are supposed to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And we are supposed to disciple new converts. Amen. Tonight, I want to continue along uh, where we stopped last week. And let me start with the words of Jesus Christ in St. John 15. And he said that, look here, he, he said that as Christians, we are supposed to be, we are supposed to bear fruit. Amen. And Jesus specified fruitfulness, let me put that way, fruitfulness as a condition for abiding in him. So we can only abide in Jesus Christ when we become fruitful. And I'm aware of the Bible scholars that are on the platform who say, boy, that fruit of the spirit there refers to your uh, the, their growth as in, in, in terms of this fruit of the spirit. So we talk about bearing fruit, talking about the fruit of the spirit, but that's one aspect. It can also be argued that he's talking about us uh, expanding ourselves, amen. Every seed, when you plant it, produce more seed or more fruit from that seed. So in a similar way, we are fruitful when we grow as Christians, but we are also fruitful, amen, when we win souls for Christ because we are expanding and expanding the kingdom of God, amen, as it were. Tonight, our aim is to look at two powerful principles for a mission-driven church. You know, last week I did say we're going to look at the uh, the role of women. Um, I, I, I feel like Jude, when he was about to write the letter uh, to the church, and he said, beloved, I give you all diligence, diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. In other words, he had one thing in mind where he wanted to go, but he felt compelled to go somewhere else. So I had in mind to speak on the role of women in the church. Um, and I was prepared to the most part, um, almost finishing doing that, but um, prayerfully, I didn't feel under God that this is where God wanted me to go. And therefore I, I decided to step away from that part for tonight, probably another time if, if, if God would so lead me and I would uh, touch that particular year. But I believe that tonight we'll examine, as we look at the mission driven church, we're going to look at two powerful, principles, two powerful things that will make the church grow. Um, we, outside of all the stuff that we spoke about, there's two things that is very needful and we have to take very uh, careful look at as a church if we are intended to grow as a church. So we're going to look at the power of unity, amen, and we're going to look at the power of structure. The power of unity, amen, and the power of structure. And I can tell you, brethren, the, there has been an attack on unity in relation to the body of Christ. And therefore, if we are not united as we should be, amen, we are not going to get the results that we can get. Amen. So there's a little saying, there's an African saying that I saw recently, and I found it to be very powerful. It says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And this speaks to the whole principle of unity. Amen. A lot of times we can get a holy done as a church. And, and when I say unity, unity does not mean uniformity, but we are one church and we are a part of the church triumphant. And if we are going to be uh, um, 
productive and if we're going to be successful in the whole area of missions it's important that one that unity is found even at the local level first secondly that unity is found in the body of christ um on a broader scale and i strongly believe that as apostolic one of the things that has caused us to not be as effective as we should be in this time and in this season because we are not as united as we should be amen um and therefore i believe in this end time there is a call amen for 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 people for the saints of god for the body of christ to be united in mission to be united in what we do in order for us to accomplish the real great commission that we speak about, which is one, to win men for the purpose, for the kingdom of Christ, and two, for us to grow up and mature people in the body of Christ. So the Psalm is right, a Psalm that I want to start with in Psalms chapter 133 from verse one to three. And there are three verses, it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. This is where I want to start. The principle of unity in relation to the mission-driven church. He said, it is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. And God to say, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descend upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forever more amen as we look at the psalm we realize a couple of things unity is something that you will know if it is present or not and if you're if you if we all know as 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 saints that we are not brethren and we have to call a spade a spade sometimes we are not as united as we should be amen when there is unity um everything seemed to run smoothly and 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 more seemed to get accomplished but when there's division and a lack of unity in the body um there seems to be a lot of chaos and confusion amen now we find that in any setting at all amen for example um when they were going to build the tower of babel and even though this is a negative negative example of 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 God himself was the one who caused the disunity. We saw where disunity caused them, amen, to not accomplish the task that they set forth to do. When they were united, the Bible said in, in I think, Genesis 11, that their hearts were so knitted together that anything they put their mind to, they were going to get it done. God came down and he saw that they, they were so united in the task of what they were going to do that they as night follow day they would have got it done and because it was something that was contrary to what god originally had and, and originally said the bible said he confused them by creating um Babel and having them to speak in different languages and therefore they could not communicate which means that one of the reasons why we are disunited in our efforts is because we are not communicating amen in a way that is that is similar among all of us we should have we should be united in doctrine we should be united in in, in where we want to go as a body and when we do these things we're going to realize that mighty things are going to be accomplished for the lord amen so we must be united. Amen. Uh, God had God, God, because of what they did at Babel, because they were not united anymore, because God confused their, 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 their tongue. Amen. It caused scattering. Amen. And the task that they wanted to accomplish could not be accomplished. Amen. So we we all know, brethren, that as a body, amen, we have to be united if we're going to be a truly mission-driven church amen sometimes we 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 fail to discern um our relationship to brothers and sisters who are part of the body of christ amen we fail to realize that if we are not united together in purpose amen and united together in what we do amen we are not going to accomplish a task and one of the reasons why we have this too is because sometimes we even forget as christians who we real or real enemy is and therefore if i don't agree a hundred percent on what you're saying you automatically become my enemy and that's a problem because the bible itself clearly teaches us that amen we wrestle not against what flesh and blood but against principalities 
against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So let's just look at what they, let us try to look at what the psalmist was saying and what principles we can pull from this and how we can use these principles, especially the principle of unity to build a mission driven church. So in Psalm 120 to 134, amen, uh, the, the, the four within a category called the Psalms of Ascent. Amen. So if you're reading from Psalms 120 to Psalms 134, all of these Psalms uh, fall within the category of, 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 of what the, 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 the Greeks put them in that category together called the Psalms of Ascent. All right. Or the Jews put it in that category called the Psalms of Ascent. Sorry. Now, why they are called the Psalms of Ascent is that Three times a year, I mean, the people would head up to the temple. Back in those days, they would head up to the temple at Jerusalem and they would head there for some, some feasts. Amen. Feast like the Passover, for example. Feast like the Feast of Weeks, which we know of Pentecost. The Feast of Tabernacles. I mean, I sure the feast that these uh, people would actually be walking um, together. Amen. And they'd be walking up, singing. So one of these psalms, Psalm 120, Psalm 121, all the way to Psalms 134. And one of the psalms they would sing is the one that we just read. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's interesting that as they were heading up to Jerusalem, amen, they had to be singing Psalm 133, that they had to be united together in order for them to sing that psalm. And God specifically placed it there to show a sign to us. That if we're going to make it to the new Jerusalem, praise God, amen, we must be united, amen. Just like all the people had to be united as they sing the songs of ascent and they march their way up uh, to, the, to, to the Jerusalem to worship at these feasts in a similar way as we march together, as we transition together this life, amen, and, and, and this world towards the new Jerusalem, amen, we are supposed to be united together. If we're going to accomplish anything, I guess that's a principle that God wanted us to get, that as we're going to be marching towards the new Jerusalem, amen, it's going to require, amen, uh, unity. So one of the Psalms that they would sing, amen, is, is Psalm 133. Um, and and it, 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 is, it is, it's interesting, as I said before, because it's as they ascend up, they would sing this song. And look at what the psalmist says. He said, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Note he refers to unity as two things. One, he said that unity is good. Amen. Why unity is good? Because it reflects the heart of God and the purpose of God. If we're going to accomplish things as a church, if we're going to be you um, do mission as a church, amen. As I said in the proverb, the African proverb, one person can do a lot, you know, but two persons can get us much further, amen. So it it it, it speaks to something that 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 as as brethren, we it is it is the heart of God for us to. To, to be united. It is good because it reflects God's heart and purpose of unity among his people. It is pleasant because it makes life together as God's people so much enjoyable. And, you know, it, 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 it removes the whole biting and conflicts that seem to dominate, amen, somehow the body. Uh, if you don't realize, brethren, one of the reasons, one of the things that the enemy will do, amen, to ensure that we do not accomplish what we should in this world, praise God, is that he would uh, introduce, amen, this unity among us. And brethren, we have to be careful. We're talking about a mission-driven church. Don't think I'm, I'm not there. We're talking about the power of unity in missions, amen. If we are going to accomplish anything, amen, it has to be done, amen, together. David had in mind the relationship that God's people have with one another. That's what he said when he said, for brethren to dwell together. This is what he had in mind, the relationship that God's people have with one another. Not with the world around them, but the, the relationship that we should have as brethren. Believers should work to have good and peaceable relationship with one together. Amen. And, and, and therefore, this is what the enemy tried to attack. It is possible as far as it depends on you to live at peace with everybody. The Bible said in Romans 12, 18, that we must live in peace with everybody. Amen. As, as, as it possible, as, as much as possible, as much as it lies within you, that we're supposed to live together in unity. Now, he used two examples uh, in the psalm that I want to highlight to show us that if we do not have unity, we are going to lack these things. Amen. 
if you're united, we're going to lack something. The first thing he said, he said it was like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment. Amen. So first of all, here it is that the psalmist was using, as it were, simile, amen, to compare what unity would be like. Amen. Normally we see uh, the word like is, is norm in, in any literature. Is, is a simile, is a comparison word. Amen. So he was comparing unity and he was looking back at what took place in Israel. Amen. And he was saying, look here, okay, unity is like this. So first of all, unity is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and that went down to the skirts of his garment. Now, when I thought about this, the first thing that came to mind is that if he said that it's like, if it's like the ointment that ran down upon Aaron's bed. I want to go back to where this first happened in scripture. I want to look at what was taking place and what God was doing so that I get an good understanding of what unity is going to do for us as a mission-driven church. Amen? So let us go back to what the psalmist was looking at. Amen? The psalmist, in order for the psalmist to make reference to this, he had to go back to the book of Leviticus, chapter 8 and verse 12. Now, that particular verse says this. It says, and Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them. And he sprinkled their off upon the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all his vessels, both the labor and his foot to sanctify them. And he poured of the anointing oil upon Heron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. So no, I want us to note something, brethren. The anointing oil in scripture is normally symbolic of the Holy Ghost. Remember last week I did say that in order for us to um, be a mission-driven church, we need the presence of the Holy Ghost. It must be led by the Holy Ghost. So here it is that he's saying that if we are united, anointing oil is symbolic to the oil that they poured upon Aaron's head. And anointing oil is symbolic in scripture of the presence of God or the Holy Ghost. Now I want us to notice a couple of stuff. The anointing oil in the book of Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 10 to 12 was sprinkled over things. So when it had to do with the furniture and the equipment and whatever they were going to use in the tabernacle, they would sprinkle the oil on it. In other words, when we are going to use anything in the kingdom of God, the instruments that we use, the mics that we use, whatever, we pray and we dedicate them to God. We sprinkle it. But when it comes to the people, I mean, the oil was not sprinkled, but the oil was poured out. In other words, when we are united together, what is going to happen is that the Holy Ghost is going to be poured out upon us. Amen. Pulled over the head of the priest in great measure. So in terms of the things, it was sprinkled. But in terms of the people, it was poured out in great measure. That simply means, brethren, that as children of God, if we are not seeing the work that we are expecting to see as a mission-driven church, we can probably check our unity. Because unity it's like the anointing oil that is poured out upon Aaron's head. If they're alike and they're similar, it means that when we are united in a similar way as the anointing oil was poured out upon Aaron's head, when we are united, the Holy Ghost, amen, is poured out upon us as a body. Sometimes, and brethren, I can tell you this, whenever we are united in purpose, Whenever we are united in doing the things of God, we are going to see some things happening in the house of God that is going to blow our minds. Amen. When we are united, we are going to come to church. When we are united in purpose and in what God would have us to do, amen, as a body, amen, we're going to come to church and realize that while we're worshiping, amen, something suddenly goes up. There is so much anointing that it's going to pull people into the house of God, amen, because they, when we are united, the anointed oil is poured out, amen, upon the heads of the people. The anointed oil, and note that principle too. You notice it's poured from the head down to the feet, which means that they speak to another principle. The unity must begin from the head. 
Amen. And then it will be flowing down to the rest of the body. A lot of times, um, a lot of the isms and the schisms that we have in the body is not due to necessarily the layman in the church, but because persons have been around for so long, this pastor don't talk to that pastor for whatever reason. This person don't do it. And we know these are realities that exist. But as a mission-driven church in 2022, where our aim is to win souls at great measure for the body of Christ, our first thing we must recognize in this lesson is that there is power in unity. Unity is like the anointing oil, the oil that was poured upon Aaron's head. Now, the purpose of the oil was twofold. The purpose of the oil was twofold. It was one, to consecrate him or to set him apart. In other words, when you are united, we are set apart. Amen. And that's what the Bible said, by this shall all men know that we are his disciples. Why? If we have love one for another. One well, of the reasons why a lot of people said they're not coming to church because too much hypocrite at church, because they can see that there's a disunity in the body. They can see that even in a local assembly, there's issues. Amen. You think it is good, brethren, if there's an issue in church, you have unsafe relatives at home, and you bring home all the issues of church in at home. You attack against the pastor, Amen. You have your family as a, and you're talking against your leaders, and you're talking against you. these things. Is, is, is what has caused problems in the body. But when we are united together, amen, it sets us apart, it consecrates us, amen. And just like all the world um, will, 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 will know that we are disciples, if we have love for one for another, we are set apart, they will see it, we become the speckle, we become the light that they look for. The world will know that we belong to Christ when we love each other, amen. And true love for one another will lead to real unity and it takes the holy spirit brethren to produce real love what am i saying when we are united it's, it's like it's like a, a circular process amen it takes the holy ghost for us to be truly united and it takes the holy spirit to also produce true love amen and we get measure of the holy spirit when the anointed oil is poured out put upon us. So love is the work of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, as children of God, if we're talking about a mission-driven church, it begins with us. There's a scripture that says judgment must begin in the house of God. In other words, in order for us to talk about within the world, we have to look at what we are doing internally. Amen. That is causing us to not be as effective as we were. And I can tell you something. Amen. One of the reasons why we are not as effective as we should be, because we are not set apart. We are not consecrated. Amen. We are united because that's what unity does. It sets us apart. Just like the anointed oil is poured upon Aaron's head. Amen. Sets him apart. Consecrates him. Uh, amen. And the second thing, it signified that, that the anointing was upon the priest. Amen. So the purpose of the oil was to signify that the anointing was upon the priest. Amen. In other words, it was the Bible says that we are kings and priests with God. So when we are consecrated and the anointing falls upon us, it means that we are kings and priests. We are we are placed in a position, amen, to, to represent the people for God. So in other words, when you become truly united, you understand your purpose. You understand what God has called you for. And you know that your purpose is to meet God on behalf of the people. Amen. I want to say the people, we're talking about a dying world that exists out there. You are a king and you're a priest with God. And, therefore, and unity brings that into place. When we are united in what God has called us to do, amen, it sets us apart and it reminds us and it anoints us uh, for the office for which God has called us. And the office don't necessarily have to be that you're a pastor or you're an evangelist or you're a prophet or you're whatever. It does simply mean that you are a priest. We are all called to be priests. Amen. Not every one of us are called to be priests. Now, I want us to note something. The Holy Spirit came upon the came down on the day of Pentecost when the saints were in one accord, meaning when the saints were united, meaning when the saints were in one mind, meaning the, 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 the oil that was like, just like the oil was poured upon Aaron, amen, and signified that he was consecrated and set apart. And the, the, the psalmist said, this is what unity is like. In a similar way, the Bible said it, it played out in the New Testament where the Holy Ghost, the anointing oil, the presence of God in a powerful way came down upon the people on the day of Pentecost 
when they were in one accord. And we can look at that scripture in Acts chapter 2. It says, and when the day of Pentecost, praise God, was fully come, they were with one accord in one place. And they go on to say, and suddenly. In other words, I'm expecting that whenever we get this right, we're going to see a suddenly, amen, a pouring of the Holy Ghost, a sudden influx of saints, a sudden a sudden thing happening, I mean, in Pentecost that we have never seen before. Any day in the end day, we get this right, just like the day of Pentecost, amen, we are going to see God doing some mighty work on our behalf. I believe where there is unity, the presence, the power of his will, amen, will be operating. And it also says that God commands his well, let me not go there. So when, 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 when the day of Pentecost came, what had happened is that they were with one accord, they were in one place, and then the Holy Ghost came and sat upon them. That's what we want. We want to be united in effort. We want to be united in purpose. We want to be united in what God has called us to do. And just like the psalmist says, it is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirt of his garment in a similar way. That's what unity does. That is what is going to happen, brethren, to the mission-driven church when we become united. Amen. He also says it is like, number two, the dew of Hermon. And that's the dew that descends upon the mountain of Zion. Again, we are seeing another similarity. The first one was like the anointing that ran over upon the head. The second one was like the dew of Hermon. And when I, when I thought about this, I, that what came to my mind is, what is the dew of Hermon? What is so special about the dew of Hermon? What is it that the psalmist saw that stood out to him, that allowed him to want to investigate this whole thing about unity in the body, the power of unity? And he said that it was like anointing oil. Note, and these are powerful uh, comparisons. He said that whenever we are united, it's like the anointing oil. And we brought that to a while ago, but he went on to say it's like the dew of Herman, and as the dew that descend upon the mountains of Zion, my God. So in my mind, I thought that if we are going to accomplish anything for God, amen, we have to be united one. But I look at it and I say, what was it that the writer knows about Herman, uh, about the mountain of Zion that I need to get from this? Amen. Because the scriptures, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. Amen. All scriptures profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction in righteousness. So I'm looking at the mission-driven church. I'm looking at the fact that we need to have power of unity. I'm looking at what the psalmist is saying here. And I'm saying he's comparing uh, unity, amen, to the dew of Hermon. Now, there are some certain things that we need to understand. Jesus made a powerful statement in, in Matthew chapter 12 and in Mark chapter 3. And he said, uh, the disciples, practically Jesus, cast out demons out of somebody, and they, 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 they the Pharisees decide to say that um, he cast it out by Beelzebub, and Jesus made a powerful statement from Matthew chapter twelve and from Mark chapter three. He said, he, he, he said, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. In Mark chapter 3, it says, and if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but at an end. And I think that Jesus wanted to bring out a principle here in relation to how the body of Christ should operate, even a mission-driven church. Amen. The first one, the first thing we have to look at is how united we are. Because if we are divided, amen, we cannot stand. If we are divided, we are not going to accomplish what we should for the body of Christ. Amen. So here it is that, that the psalmist said it is like the dew of Hermon. Now, I missed it before, what exactly is the dew of Hermon? Amen. So I, I did some little research. Um, because that's where you should go when you look at scripture. You want to know what these things mean. You want to go in depth as, as possible uh, to get 
a good understanding of what the scripture is saying. Um, I tell people when you study the scripture, you what is called a grammatical historical context in the sense of grammatical historical method. In the sense that you look at the grammar of the words, and you also look at the, the the historical or the history or the culture behind it. So, what is it that the psalmist knew about Herman that we probably need to get? So, here's a picture of what Herman looks like. Is that true picture? If you and and this is found in Israel, you can notice, notice how it looks. At the top of it, it looks white. In other words, it is it almost like snowy. Uh, I think the, the, the Muslim call it white mountain or something like that. Um, it is it, it, it is that particular mountain is also we find that mountain in the book of Deuteronomy chapter three and Joshua chapter twelve. Um, and it is the northern boundary of what is called the Amorite kingdom. And when when they when they um Israelites took over the promised land, um half tribe of Manasseh uh were to the east side of this river. So we realize that the 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 mount the, the mountain that this is talking about was practically uh on the boundary of the Amorite kingdom and they, they this was where the half tribe of Manasseh actually dwelt somewhere in this region now what was important about this mountain and and why is it that the psalmist would actually use this as an example say that this is what unity is now one of the things you must understand about this particular mountain I just saw a while ago it was high above the valleys and the plains of, Mal of Palestine. And actually, it's about 9,000 feet above the sea. Now, all the areas that were around it uh, were, were practically, if you know anything about Palestine, most of the area is dry. Dry. It's not as, as, as grassy and, 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 and watery as it were, as, as, as the mountain that we saw here. So the mountain was so great that from, 30 miles away. It was about 30 miles in length and 15 miles wide. And it could be seen, sorry, from great distance. Now, as I said before, one of the things that would have happened is that the, 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 because the top of the mountain was so high, it would, it would be cold. It would produce a lot of um, dew. It would be always wet in comparison to everywhere else around. And there were times when it got so so much water that the water would flow from the mountains down to the valleys and it would make the place green and flourishing and the flourishing would come from the waters that come from the mountain. So the mountain, the dew of Herman was very important to them because it speaks to uh, the, 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 the waters and the, 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 the many things, uh, the, the, we call it now, that the snowy feeling that happened at the top of the mountain and sometimes it would flow from the top of the mountain down into the valley and water the plants and water the grass amen so the dew of herman was somewhat refreshing to the rest of palestine amen and and just like the oil that flowed from heron's head to the skirt even so the dew would flow from the top of the rainy mountain to the bottom and it would produce water for the land. What am I saying? Is that when we are united, brethren, we are looking at a world that is dry. We're looking at a world that is in need of God's presence. And two things we produce. We produce for them water, which is refreshing in our unity. The unity that the church has is it's able not only to flow from us, but to water this world and allow this world to want to come to know something. There is something refreshing about a united body. There's something refreshing, I mean, about a church that is united. And apart from the fact that it is united, like the dew of Herman, it's also like the oil. So there's an anointing that flows from the head down to the bottom uh, when, when we are united. And therefore, we are not accomplishing some things that we are not getting some things that we should uh, because we need to check, brethren, our unity. Praise God. And you know, the funny thing, the Psalm ended by saying, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Amen. So it is when we are united, then true blessing will come. A lot of us want to see Pentecost again. A lot of us have heard of, of I want to say Pentecost again. I know we have crusades. I know we have street service and we have convention. Amen. And we see one and two get the Holy Ghost. 
Amen. But I don't know about you. I personally believe that if we are united like they were on the day of Pentecost, we are going to see a whole lot more. We're going to see some, we're going to see the dew of Hermon. Amen. We're going to see that same water refreshing and flowing in the kingdom of God, flowing in its dry and its thirsty land. Praise God. That is in need of the true water of life. Amen. Which comes when we are truly united. Amen. We are blessed when we are united. We are empowered when we are united. We are strengthened when we are united. We accomplish holy more when we are united. As I said before, with one person, they can go fast, but two can go far. And once we get it together, once we get it as it were, as a body, this is where the Lord is going to command the blessing. The, it's not a case where God is just going to bless, but God command. When somebody commands something, if God commands, so it must happen. Praise God. The Lord is going to command a blessing upon us whenever we get the whole idea of what it truly means to be blessed, to be united as a body. Now, let me give you a little story. I mean, a lesson from history behind the Great Wall of China. Amen. And to show us why unity is very, very important in the body. We all are aware of the Great Wall of China. Um, um, it, 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 there was in several centuries ago, the, the ancient Chinese people wanted to secure their, their borders against people that were trying to evade um, from the north. And so they come together and they build a wall that's called, we know it as the Great Wall of China. Amen. And it stretched about 1,500 miles. It was about 12 to 40 feet wide and about 20 to 50 feet high. Amen. And the wall of China is so great and so thick and so wide that it is said that, that they, could, they could carry chariots on the wall. Amen. Not only that, it is so big that it is one of the only man-made structure amen, that you can actually see clearly from outer space. So outer space, they're able to see the wall of China. Amen. That's how massive uh, the wall was. Praise God. Now, look what happened. I'm say it was built wide enough on the top for chariots and for patrol. And if they heard of an attack at distant location, they could easily get to it. So people could not attack them because they were united. In other words, the enemy is what is attacking our mission. The enemies are what are attacking what we are planning to do. But guess what? If we are united, we're in a position where we're one, we're able to see the enemy from far. Two, he can't go over the wall. He can't go under the wall. He can't go around the wall. Because guess what? That's what unity does for us. It, it, it gives us strength. It puts us together. The height uh, gave us superior advantage over our enemy. Amen. And, and we know that when we are united, we are seated together in heavenly places. Amen. We are in we, are, we, are, we have an advantage, praise God, over the enemy and what the enemy can do. Now, guess what happened now? In the first 100 years, the Great Wall of China, the nation was invaded three times. And you might ask me, how is it that people were able to break through the walls of China? How is it that people were able to get in and invade China? Let me tell you what happened. An enemy, and this is true history, Bribe the gatekeepers and enter the land unprotected. I quoted from Mark chapter 3, 24 to 26 a while ago. And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Can I tell you something? One of the reasons why we are not getting the results that we should get is because somebody has bribed the gatekeeper and entered the land undetected. There is some, there is some disunity. Somebody decided, look here, we're not we're holding things together. In other words, all the gatekeepers are to ensure that, look here, we are going to hold the gate and we build the wall for the purpose of keeping out invaders. And together, we're going to keep it up. But if somebody decides to compromise in your lifestyle, if somebody decides to compromise in, in certain things, amen, if I can't work with you as a brother, amen, what I am doing, I am leaving the gate open for the enemy to come in. And the enemy have a way of coming in only when we are not united. That's why he loves chaos. That's why he loves this unity because he knows that's his, that's his gateway in, amen. That's the reason why we can't accomplish what we should for the body of Christ. But brethren, there is a power in unity. There is a power, amen, in getting to where God wants us to be. And that's just been my heartbeat from the other day for us to realize the power that exists in unity. 
So the first thing is that as a mission driven church, we must understand three lessons. One, we are stronger together than we are by ourselves. When we are united, that is why Jesus specifically sent out the disciples two by two. Amen. Paul himself, when he was going on his missionary journey, had Paul and Barnabas. And another time he had Paul and Silas. Amen. Amen. Unity. Never diminish the importance of unity in the body of Christ. Because if we do, we run the risk of being invaded by the enemy. Once we don't realize the importance of our brethren. Amen. And, and trust me, um, the enemy of a way of attacking from the weakest end. Remember when the children of Israel were coming uh, out of Egypt. Amen. The, 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 the enemy would attack the, the, the tribe that was at the back. Amen. And attack the weakest tribe. That's what the enemy does. He attacks the weakest. But we have to recognize this and ensure that the weakest among us, amen, we can protect them. And those, we keep the unity. If we realize that brother is struggling, amen, they that are spiritual should restore such a one with the spirit of meekness, considering that yourself that you don't all so far. We need this in the body of Christ because if we don't do this, we run the risk of allowing the enemy to come in. The enemy will attack and cause ineffectiveness and destruction when we are not united. Brethren, we are only seeing two souls, three souls getting saved um, um, in a convention of 10 weeks when, because there is a lack of unity sometimes in the body. Not all the time, but there is a lack of unity. And once we get the unity right, we're going to see God doing some powerful things in our midst. Amen. We're talking about ambition driven church. We're looking at every aspect. We're trying to fill the gaps. We're trying to look at what can we do internally that will cause us to be effective out there? And brethren, one of the things that we need to do as a body is to be united. Do you know that there are many churches out there that are struggling, apostolic churches that are struggling, and they have churches on the other side that are blooming, and the blooming churches don't help the struggling ones. But yet we forget that while we are at different locations and different side of the vineyard, we are one body. Amen. And I've never heard, praise God, if something is wrong with my, my, my foot, amen, it affects how I walk. It affects a whole lot of things. If I'm feeling pain in my finger, if you have a toothache, as, 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 even though it's one little part of your body, you make a can sleep. Because one part of the body is affected. That's how united we must be. When we understand that when somebody else is struggling, when a church is struggling, when, when a body is struggling, it affects all of us because we are in this mission together. And the same thing applies to the local church. When we realize that there's a seed to the church who's struggling, amen. When we realize that there are issues in the body, amen. We need to deal with these issues and deal with them right and quickly and off the bat. Don't leave it. Don't leave no room for the enemy to come in because we want, once we do that, we are going to get be as effective as we should in the body of Christ. So our first thing is that for a mission-driven church, we must understand the power of unity. The second thing is the power of structure. Amen. There has to be a structure in how we do missions. Praise God. So the Bible actually endorses the wisdom of structure and planning. You know, a lot of people, when they think about church, they're saying, boy, you know, they're so spirity that they forget that, look here, God is a God of order. Amen. But the mission driven church must see evangelism as a divine human effort to accomplish the plan and purpose of God. Amen. So the mission driven church must realize that we, we, it's a divine human effort. Divine because God is in Bible. Human because God expects us to do something. Amen. And therefore, it's important that we have a structure in place in terms of what we are going to do, how we're going to accomplish some of these things. Amen. To, to, to win souls for Christ. Amen. So the structure exists for the purpose of achieving God's given purpose and plan. Not to create a rigid corporate institutional organization. No, that's not the aim of structure. We are, we are not an organization. We are an organism. Amen. We are a living organism, but we still need structure. We're not trying to create this rigid corporate area type of thing. Amen. But what we're trying to do is have order. Amen. Structure is flexible to accommodate the guidance of the Holy Ghost. That's what the Bible says. Let all things in the book of Corinthians be done decently and in order. In other words, God is a God of order and peace, and he wants the church to come together in unity, and he also wants the church to do things the way he would do it. He is a God of order. Notice how he did things. When he was creating the world, he did not create man first. He created everything that the man needed, 
and then he placed man in the garden having placed everything that man needed he's a god of order he knew what to put first what to put second what to put third and then he put the man after he had put everything in place in order for us to be effective in evangelism brethren we need to understand that we need a structure so that you can accommodate the guidance of the holy spirit the bible compares the church to the human body and with each body working together praise god so each part of the body must work together amen romans uh first corinthians 12 verse 12 says for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body though many are one body so it is with christ so the body has many members it has hands it has feet it has eye it has two it has many members and notice all the members don't operate the same way amen i don't look to my fingers and I don't speak through my toe, all right? These things don't happen. In other words, we have to recognize as a body that when we are going to do evangelism, there has to be some form of structure, but we have to understand the role that each of us will play in the structure of evangelism. Not all of us can be a mouth, not all of us can be a hand, not all of us can be a toe, but all of us must play our part in the body. And we must find our place in the body and operate from that particular place. Praise God. So that if the structure provides purpose and direction, it eliminates confusion. Uh, for, so as I said earlier, my hand can't start behave like my foot. All right, I don't have a problem. Or my head start behave like, I don't have a problem. Um, so everything has its purpose. And therefore, when we understand our purpose and we put ourselves in our rightful place, then it's going to eliminate the confusion because we know what we are supposed to do. It permits proper decisions. It establishes accountability. It harmonizes ministry with the will of God. I mean, that is purpose. Let all things be done decently and in order. As I said before, in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, God is not the author of confusion. And even though the scripture was making reference in the context about the gifts of the spirit and how it should be operated in the body, it can be applied here. Amen. Because in a similar way, the way Church of Corinth was operating the nine supernatural spiritual gifts, but it was a case of confusion. And Paul had to say, God is not the author of confusion. Things should be done decently and in order amen i strongly believe that a lot of times even when the holy ghost come upon some of us it's not for the purpose of just speaking in tongues and running up and down which a lot of us do amen and we we run out the anointing praise god that should be used for something else but because we're not sensitive to what god is have us to do and we're not we, we, are, we are more spirit than spiritual we tend to do a lot of jumping up and down and therefore to the unsaved we become like crazy people as opposed to people who are leading people to god but that's another topic altogether but anyway brethren structure establishes accountability and it harmonizes ministry with the will of god amen but he therefore followers of God as their children, Ephesians chapter one, five and verse one. So if God is not the author of confusion and we must be followers of God, it means that as children of God, we must also have structure and not be confused in how we operate as a mission driven church. Now, the book of Exodus brought us a principle that I want us to, to look into as we talk about the, the power of structure. Now, it is said that when Moses, I actually met up with, his, with Jethro and Jethro was his father-in-law and he was in the, 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 the Midian desert. And if you know anything about Jethro, Jethro was the priest of Midian at that time. And he was also Moses' father-in-law. And he heard all that Moses was done uh, for Israel. And he, 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 was, he was happy. He, he glorified God when Moses report what the Lord was doing among him and for the people of Israel, the man that hired for the people of God. But he gave Moses an advice. And one of the things I liked about Moses is that he was teachable. He was able to, 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 to look at what Jethro was saying and make sense of it and realize and even put it into practice. And then he realized that he was able to accomplish a lot. So it says in Exodus chapter 18, verse 17 to 23, and Moses' father-in-law said unto him, the things that thou doest is not good. Because what Moses was doing, Moses was doing everything. He was taking on all the tasks. In a similar way, we need to understand as a body that we can't take on everything. 
Amen. One person can do everything. Pastor can do everything. Imagine pastor doing, being the missions director, pastor being the head of house to house, being the head of home Bible study, being the head of, no, you're stressing out pastor. That, that would be, that, that's going to be ineffective. So I'm saying the thing that God does is not good. Thou will surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel. Praise God. I will give thee counsel and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to God word that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws and shall show them the way wherein they must walk and the work they must do. Then he continues to say, moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, a hating covetousness, and place such over to be rulers of thousands. So you're going to have some people who are going to be rulers of thousands, and then rulers of hundreds, and then rulers of 50, and rulers of 10. So here it is that he set up a structure in how uh, Moses should operate. So you're going to have somebody who is probably a ruler over a thousand, but within that structure, you have somebody who is a ruler of 10. And then that structure, you have a person who is a ruler of 50. So you're breaking it down and you're, you're creating a hierarchy. You know? So Moses is at the top. Amen. And then for Moses, you had somebody who report to him who rules this first thousand and this second thousand and this. And then you had somebody who report to them and they keep on having a structure because structure is important in the body. Brethren, as it relates to mission, this is what is an example of what a structure should look like in a mission driven church. We know that the Lord is the ultimate aim, leader of the church. Amen. He is the person who rules the church. Amen. It is his church. It's, it's, we are, it is not our church. It is his church. He is the He's the one who guides us and tells us when we should go and when we should come, what we should do, what we should not do. So on. he is the ultimate. But at the, at the top of any local assembly, amen, God has placed an under shepherd who we call our pastor. And what the pastor has said before cannot do everything. So like in my assembly, we have what is called a missions director who reports to the pastor. Now what the mission director does, he's in charge of this powerful era. Remember we started, we said there are three uh, ministries that we should do as a body. There's ministry to God, which is through our worship and our prayer and our thanksgiving and whatever. That's ministry to God. Then there's ministry to uh, the saints, which we talk about discipleship and how do we keep them, how do we grow them up, so on and so forth. But there's also ministry to the unsaved. And this is the task of the mission director to ensure that his reach is for the uh, people that are on the outside but him can do it by himself so he has sections under him remember I said before like the body you have a hand you have a foot you have eyes the mission director is in charge he's like the brain right of of this mission work and then he has different uh arms that work under him. We have the host to host, a host to host leader who reports to the mission director, we have a home Bible study leader who reports to the mission director, we have a street service outreach leader, so on and so forth. And, and notice I put an orange one called a research leader. Oh, that's a special group. Um, and I'm going to talk about that later on. So you have the host to host leader, the home Bible study leader, the street service leader, so on and so on and so forth, probably child ministry, whatever the case is. And then under the host to host leader, you have a team of persons who work with him. Under the home Bible study, you have a team of persons who work with him. Under the uh, street service, you have a team of persons who work with him. All the way down to the research uh, who has a team of persons who work with them. Now, this is a structure, amen. And this is something that God can work with because now we have a structure and we are placing this structure to God. We are saying, God, we know that everybody in church don't necessarily are teachers, but you have some persons who are willing to go host to host, amen, and to do some work and to hand out a trap, amen, and therefore we place them in that group. You have some persons who are good at organizing and planning crusades and street services, I will put them in that group. You have persons who are good at teaching and they have a, they have a love for teaching. As a matter of fact, I, I, I was a part of the home Bible study group, so I know that area of mission very well. Amen. So 
And but I'm also now a part of the research team that this research at church. But these things are very important for mission outreach. So let's just look at each of these areas and see what they can be done in the body. And see if the Bible even back them up. So in Acts chapter 20 and verse 20, it says, How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. So here it is, we're seeing even from the book of Acts. I mean, that persons would move from host to host and bring the gospel message uh, to people. Uh, so in a similar way, I call the host to host ministry the 2020 vision of the church. In other words, it, it, that particular ministry goes out and it goes to different, different houses. It gives them the track, gives them an invitation to church. It tells them about the gospel at its basic form and it it it. it, it Put them on persons who are interested now in getting involved in home Bible study. I want a lesson, or you might have a conversation with somebody, start talking about, for example, why we baptize in Jesus' name, why we believe in the Holy Ghost, and they might have questions. I would say, no, you know what? We can we can continue this conversation. You want to be a part of our home Bible study team? Say, so, yeah, man, and then you pass on that person's name. So you realize that the body is working together in unity. The host to host team goes out, they do their thing in the area, and they pass on their, their information to the home Bible study team. So the host to host does some things. It's a form of evangelism that involves an organized group of saints from a local assembly going from host to host and sharing the gospel in a targeted community. So normally how we would do it back in the day, or how we do it is that we might say, okay, for the month of July, the host to host team is going to the, to the era of Marvelly and they would canvas that era. So they go with track, they have a cup, they meet on a Saturday, at a certain time, probably in the morning or in the evening, they pray about it and they go house to house. House to house is normally being done in a community in close proximity to the local church. Because one of the era, one of the aim of house to house um, is to win souls uh, that are in your immediate vicinity. Amen. You have to target your Jerusalem first before we can talk about Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world, right? So the house to house team looks in their area, their exact area and try to target that area. The term is usually equipped with gospel track and the team, sorry, is normally equipped with gospel tracks and 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 they walk the streets and they visit the home and they pray with people and they, 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 they talk to people and people who are interested, they pass on their names to the home Bible study ministry. The second one is the home Bible study and this should be home Bible study here, sorry. So the home Bible study ministry is a study of Bible conducted by states in a small group or in on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, as I said before, what would have happened is that the host to host would have gone out and do their canvassing, get into the communities first. They're like the, the, the first of foot soldiers who go in and all they're doing is handing out tracks. And this is our dino. I'm just trying to, to get us in a mission-minded tone and also assist with persons who work in the mission department or anywhere to see how best we can incorporate some of these things. This is still Bible study, brethren. So what they would do, we apply the same Acts 2020 scripture where it says, he kept back nothing helpful, but proclaimed to you and taught you publicly from host to host. So what will happen is that the home Bible study group now would get their information from the host to host group and they would go in uh, to persons who are interested. So home Bible study is usually conducted in a non-formal setting, typically in a home of one person being taught. Home Bible study is also conducted at various other convenient locations, such as the home of the teacher and place of work or street corner. It can be done anywhere. Anywhere that, that, that the student wants you to meet them. But guess what? When you get the task, um, go out and do it. But ensure that when you do this, you know what you're teaching, right? Home Bible study targets uh, unsafe person as a means of soul winning. However, the strategy is sometimes used to strengthen new converts in the church. So sometimes in some churches, the home Bible study team also strengthens new converts, right? Home Bible study can help share the gospel with others and is especially helpful to those who are not naturally good at talking to others about the plan of salvation. So what it normally does, it, it assists you. And one of the things you can do, brethren, is that you, you, you normally paired people. So you have somebody who is skilled in the word with somebody that is just coming in into the home Bible study team. And you pair them together and you put them so the one that is so is, is a little bit skilled. We learn from the they, they, they learn from the and the one that is not so skilled. We learn from the skill, and then we and we realize that people will grow in the body. That's both discipleship and training at the same time, brethren. All right. Then you have what is called hospital ministry. Amen. So in Acts chapter twenty verse eight it says, and it happened that the father of 
Publius lay sick of the fever and whatever. Paul went to, into him and prayed and he laid hands on him and healed him. There are people who are specifically geared at going to the hospitals, which is also a ministry that can, that's an arm of mission. You have a lot of sick people in the hospital and God knows God can use you. So people who who know God has blessed them with the gift of healing and they love the word can be involved in this because you can go into the hospital and you're able to minister to people, to sick people, give them track. And trust me, a lot of people when they're on their sick bed and when they're, and this is the time they, they really want to know about Christ. And it's, it's an opportunity for you to spread the gospel and we take every opportunity that we can. So hospital ministry, you visit people, you pray for them, you bring care packages, you do what you need to do because we become all things to all men that we might win some, not win all, but we're going to win some. I mean, so we have to organize ourselves in a way. And persons who, who know that you, you can't at hospital wouldn't be involved in hospital ministry. But you have persons who love this type of ministry. They love going out and praying for people. And you might share with them a track. And again, when they come out, you might introduce them again to the home Bible study team who will do further teaching. All right. And then you have street service or outreach ministry, um, which can also involve the whole era of uh, crusades and 10 crusades and so on and so convention. So you have people who plan this, which is also a part of ministry. And their main aim is to get into communities and to spend time setting up street service or, or crusades. I remember one time when we used, when we had that, it's a tent that we had at Marvalley Park. We usually use them for a lot of 10 crusades. So we went to Spanish Town and we spent like six weeks. And we went to East Kingston and we spent like four weeks. I went to different, different. We're going to I have a lot of saints who are in church today who got saved from these 10 crusades. So we spent weeks and we had a team specifically that planned this. Amen. And note when you plan stuff like this, because it's a mission driven uh, ministry, it means that the messages that come from our street services and the messages that come from a 10 crusade should be geared toward the gospel message. Your message is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You're preaching about the woman at the well. You're preaching about God saving people and God can save people. So we have to know what our message is, I mean, and what we are going to be preaching in relation to winning souls for the kingdom of God. Amen. They have what is called the follow-up ministry. And this is where now after we have done uh uh Canvassing and gone into certain communities, and we 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 minister to people and we pass their names over either to the home Bible study. You have another group that does follow up. So if somebody's not necessarily interested per se in home Bible study, then you can have persons following up by just giving them a call or by 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 going back to say, okay, we realize that we came and we visited you, or even people who come to church and we take their names. You have a special team that give them a call every now and then. I say, boy, we know you visit our church last week or two weeks ago we're happy that you came blah 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 i can give them a word um of encouragement paul and barnabas did the same thing we saw this here we know in acts chapter 15 there was a contention and it ended up that paul didn't even get to go back until the third missionary but his aim was to actually go back to the cities that he has that, that he has preached on his first missionary journey so it is a principle that we must do follow up ministry we don't we don't just invite people to church or people come to church and we take your name for name purposes i will have it in a book no somebody must have a number or something that we can follow up a follow-up team that actually does that work all right no as i said earlier there is a special team that is for missions that i believe that most churches we are persons at church who are are good at training are good at delivering the word and therefore in our mission team we have what is called a project team or a training arm now that arm is responsible for training all the areas of mission and that arm is responsible for identifying when false doctrines come in to create pamphlets to write tracks to train the team so all that team does which is also a part of missions but their mission is to equip the outgoers. So it's important that training should be an ongoing thing for the mission driven church, right? The mission driven church must ensure that the basic doctrine of the apostles is taught on a cycle of it's keep on taught. So every year there is an area of mission, uh, area of doctrine that has been taught. And this is where the training group or the training area comes in because you are going to be training the people. So you realize that, okay, for the first quarter, we're going to deal with we're going to go back over repentance, baptism, and the Holy Ghost. For the second quarter, we're going to look at the oneness of God, so on and so forth. And this is based on a principle that we find in Deuteronomy chapter 6, which says that uh, if doctrine is not taught, the people will forget. 
and then there will be a decline in the church. So a lot of times people, they will know Acts 2.38, but guess what? It must be done on a secular basis where uh, you have a team that actually keeps the mission arm up to date. So we must, brethren, uh, teach stuff like, for example, the new birth, the oneness of God, the wholeness of life and Christian living, end time events, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what the training arm is going to be doing, training the body, amen. So it's really a part of the mission team. And if you look at back at the diagram that I placed originally, you can see I placed it in orange because that's not a team that interfaces directly with the unsaved, but this is the, the, the team that interfaces with the team that goes out to the unsaved. I want to ensure that these people who are going out to the work are very equipped. The house to house people should know stuff about how to do house to house. The altar worker must know how to do stuff. So there should be an arm that trains them, amen, in terms of what they should do. How, what's the best practice for host to host? What's the best practice for 10 crusade? What do we need? How how do we set ourselves? Um, what's the best approach, you know? And all of these things, when we organize and we have a structure, as before, God is a God of order. He will be able to work with us, amen. Now, I'm going to close with seven, seven reasons why we should do missions. Seven reasons why we should do missions. One, Paul said in to the Roman church, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Brethren, we must be willing to do this. We must be willing to not be ashamed. And wherever we must find a place in the kingdom to work amen um not all of us are teachers not all of us are are brave home bible study people um some of us can do house to house and hand a track some of us can be involved in in child ministry so there are several reasons why it should drive you as a church to do missions number one jesus came to seek and to save the lost number two we truly believe that there is no other way to be saved you know, Acts 4 verse 12 says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. So uh, if you are convinced of this, then it's going to push you to the mission. Three, how else shall they hear? So in other words, we are convinced that they can't hear this gospel message unless you preach it or you teach it. Amen. So we are convinced to do mission because they can't hear it unless we bring it. Amen. And because they can't hear it, Jesus commanded us to do it because they, we need them to hear it. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God commanded us to go. Jesus does not want anyone to perish. As I said before in 2 Peter 3, 9. So Jesus doesn't want any to perish. So, and men are really lost if they're outside of Jesus Christ. So we must do it. The word lost comes from a root word meaning ruin or destroyed. So therefore, outside of Jesus Christ, man is like, you know, like when the world was without form and void and then the spirit of God moved upon the face of, amen. We need the spirit of God to move upon them and to bring some order to their lives and to pull them back to where they should be in him. Amen. Number seven, we want to please God and to bring glory to his name. And therefore, persons who don't do mission are persons who really don't understand the heart of God, who understand what God has called them to. Amen. Because if you really want to please God, you must understand the heart of God. And the heart of God is to seek and to save them that are lost. We are debtors to every man, every single man, to give him the gospel in the same measure in which we have received it. Somebody was praying for you. Somebody fast for you. Somebody pray with you at the altar. Somebody ensure that you them not leave until they get baptized in Jesus. name. somebody was there with you. And I pray, God, that we will be like, you know, Jeremiah, at one point in time, he preached and he, he never seen a result. And he preached and never seen a result. But he said in Jeremiah 29, then said, I, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. You know, some of us, I, I pray that whenever that thought come or that feeling come or that type of attitude come, that there would something like Jeremiah would say, but his word was in me. My heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. In other words, I want some people to be so mission driven, to be so, to, to be so, so, so full that, that, that look here, I must reach men for Christ. We are debtors, brethren, to every man to give him the gospel 
in the same measure in which we have received it. Tonight, we speak about two things. We spoke about the power of unity in missions. And we spoke about the power of structure in missions. I pray, God, that we were blessed tonight. And I pray, God, that we have learned something in relation to our mission-driven church. Yes, God, I hope that we were blessed by Bible study tonight. Let's close our eyes as we close out in prayer. Great God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for tonight. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were able to speak to our hearts. I pray right now, God, Lord Jesus, that you will uh, continue, Lord Jesus, to help us to the principles that we have learned tonight, that we'll try to apply them, the principle of unity. Amen. Help us, Lord Jesus, to move together in love. Help us, Lord Jesus, to realize that when we work together, amen, we can accomplish great things for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your study tonight. I pray God to continue to bless every person, bless our bishop, bless faith chapel of faith apostolic ministries, bless God, this assembly. Help us, Lord Jesus, to have a grand time next week and help us, Lord Jesus, to be prayed up and ready to receive a great time in the presence of the Lord. God, we look to you and we thank you for in everything we give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. Bless, keep, hallelujah, and help us, Lord Jesus, to be ready and to hold the forth because you are coming. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your mercy one more time. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. God bless you. In Jesus' name.